throughout the state of today, the Syrian regime, other groups in Syria, Yazidis, Kurds, basically anybody who doesn't share their extremist, uh, their view of uh, Islam and, and, and uh, organized society. And then the third goal is to take that fight as well to the far enemy, that is to say, uh, Europe, the United States, and those um, who will have to be in their mind part of the inevitable final battles uh, that will result in the victory of true believers. So it's this mixture of global uh, jihadi views and territorial goals in a specific place and time that makes Daesh or uh, ISIS uh, different from some of the other groups that are out there. And then as Dr. Jemai noted, they have a belief that highly visible acts of violence have an important role in how they go about meeting their goals. Now, one of the things that I think caught people by surprise when they uh, started looking at this, they thought that um, ISIS had made a fundamental error and that they would get bogged down in step one, which is creating and maintaining uh, a, a geographic base in the Middle East, that they would get stuck there. They would be surrounded by enemies, that all of their enemies taken up and trying to manage and defend this base. And it is true that they are under attack, that they are on the defensive. Um, they have lost uh, territory. They currently do not have territorial links between their holdings in Syria and in Iraq. Um, they continue to lose territory as we speak. The ancient city of Palmyra fell to Syrian government forces at the end of March. Uh, the Kurdish forces have made several recent inroads into their territories in Syria. They're slowly being rolled back in Iraq. Uh, President Obama went out on a limb recently and said that he thought Iraqi forces would retake Mosul, which is uh, the largest city in Iraq that ISIS controls, by the end of this year. But the analysts were wrong in thinking that this would prevent, and all of this would prevent ISIS from also pursuing its broader goal of uh, promoting global uh, confrontation between true believers as they consider themselves to be and those who oppose them. So, the Russian airliner that was down on the Sinai, the attacks in Turkey, in Beirut, in Paris, and in Brussels show us that they are both willing and capable to pursue that goal at one and the same time. And in particular, the sophistication of the Paris and Brussels attacks took many off guard. It's one thing to see isolated attacks by individuals that are inspired by the example gives them, but Paris and Brussels were coordinated, organized, uh, attacks with operational links to individuals in Syria, uh, with complicated logistics, and uh, this makes it different from what the so-called lone wolf attacks that had previously been seen. Um, now, one of the things that surprised the analysts is that there is, you know, from a military point of view, is a, a logical inconsistency here. Why would you deliberately go provoke another enemy to attack you if you're busy building a base in another region? Um, that doesn't make sense, so to speak. So they were surprised that it was happening anyway. But from the ISIS point of view, it does make sense because they have a rather um, apop apocalyptic view of the future. They think that um, history is inevitably moving towards a uh, massive collision. Uh, they would love hunting, for example. They do see a clash of civilizations. And part of their job is to promote that and accelerate it and get to that point so that the final victory can occur. So it's not troubling to them that what they do when they attack uh, in Brussels or in Paris is that they may increase the existing fight back in many in the Middle East. As Professor Jemai pointed out, France was not absent in conflict in the region already, but their presence certainly increased after the attacks have decreased. So they see this, uh, and their devotion to extreme violence also means that doing things that attract media attention and attacks in the West, as we've seen, attract more media attention than attacks in, say, Iraq. I'm always struck when I see the numbers that Professor Jemai posted about the number of people who actually died from terrorist attacks in recent history. Iraq is at the top of the list. Uh, that always gives me pause. Uh, but it's not something you see in the media every day. But if something happens in the major Western European 
city, you're going to see it discussed at infinitum uh, in social media and, and other places. Um, Professor Jemai mentioned another reason why they would attack in Western Europe, which is to shrink the gray, the gray zone he was talking about, because part of their job is to um, force a choice to drive apart uh, Muslims from the infidel and France being the home of the largest Muslim population in Western Europe is naturally a place you would want to do that. Um, I won't go into that any further, although for me it's a fascinating topic, but uh, we only have so much time. So, what now? The regional context. I want to start with the regional context to underline the point that groups such as ISIS do not emerge from thin air. We tend to talk about them in terms of uh, the, the, the horrificness of their actions, um, what may or may not make them different from other groups. We often forget to put them in their regional, and their, their social, and economic, and everything context. Um, uh, Matt mentioned that uh, he disagreed with Prime Minister Bultz that you don't ask questions in some way, in some way, shape, or form, seeking to justify what can happen. And but I agree with Matt that you certainly do ask questions if you want to understand what something has happened, so that you can particularly if you want to prevent it from happening again. You have to ask questions about motives, and, uh, and you can't have a valid response otherwise. So, and you know, because at the end of the day, the threat that a group like that poses to people in the Middle East or in France will only disappear once the conditions that created them change. So, condemning them doesn't change the fact that they exploit existing problems that predate them. In any case, there were groups before Daesh and ISIL that practiced terrorism. There will be others after. And you have to understand what drives them to make those choices and uh, deal with those issues as well. Um, Hassan Hassan, who is uh, an analyst at Chatham House in the UK and also works for the Tafir Institute for Middle East Policy, likes to say that ISIS is a symptom of a disease, not the disease itself. And I think that's one way to look at it. Uh, if you have a fever, you treat the fever, but you also ask, why do I have a fever? Uh, in this regard, I think it's interesting to look at the results from the recent Asda Bursted Marsteller 2016 Arab Youth Survey. <clears throat> I also like to do this because, again, I think too often we tend to talk about the Middle East uh, and political de developments in the Middle East without looking at the beliefs and opinions of the people who live in that region, um, particularly the young people are often overlooked. And this is the eighth annual survey that they have done, um, polling 18 to 24 year olds in 16 Arab countries. It's the largest survey of its kind. Because they've been doing it for eight years, you're starting to get baseline data, which is extremely important in polling. And it covers a wide range of subjects, so I'm only going to treat uh, their opinions about uh, that relate to today's topic. But it's a, it's a wide ranging survey. They're doing a big, uh, great service to, um, to for social science in the region by uh, by covering this uh, this topic in this way. Uh, so there it is. The good news is uh, the overwhelming majority of the people in this category across all 16. Uh, countries, what does it say there? Uh, reject ISIS and believe that it will fail. Um, this uh, number is higher than it was last year and has consistently been high since the huge surprise so since they started this survey and since this became uh, part of the questions they've asked. Um, as you recall, eight years ago, But consistently and increasingly, they reject what ISIS represents and they believe it will fail. Um, it is seen as a major problem facing the region today. This is all very encouraging. But what I think is fascinating is when you get to the question of what they think attracts people to ISIS. And the top response is 25% average response. The top response is, I don't know. So one in four. I don't have an answer to that question, so don't feel bad. 24% um, or so just behind that say that it's lack of jobs and opportunity is the main driver. Um, the next response, the next highest response suggests that ISIS is the view of Islam or Sunni.
needs she attention, those are the things that draw people to it. Um, it's a fairly low response. I'm always struck by, by having I don't know top out uh, in the, uh, this response. Um, and I'm not saying that this is right in any way, shape, or form. Remember, you're dealing with a sample here that overwhelmingly rejects ISIS. So they're probably not the right people to ask uh, about what attracts people. But, but it's important to know what they think. <coughs> Not whether it's right or not, but what they think. And what they think is, A, they're a little clueless. They're not sure what they think. And B, lack of opportunity is one of the first things that comes to their mind. Now, um, there are two ways of really looking at this. One is to say, well, it's comforting that a wide-ranging group of Arab youth find the organization repellent and incomprehensible. But it's also troubling, I think, to think that they don't have a better idea of what drives this phenomenon. It's always hard to combat something that you don't understand. But one thing that is very clear in this survey, and this has been true from day one, since they started this survey, is that the overwhelming concern of Arab youth is the lack of employment opportunities for young Arabs in their countries. It shines out from the results in this and many other the other questions they ask, and it has for several years. Fewer than half those surveyed believe that there are job opportunities for them in their home country. And for the fifth year running, the UAE wins when they ask the question, uh, where's the most attractive place you'd like to live in the region? Largely because of its reputation for giving young Arabs an opportunity to work. I think it's also significant that the UAE is a place that has um, been somewhat successful in encouraging a fairly diverse um, social environment. But they pick it largely because they think they can get a job. Uh, this leads me to think that uh, economic support for countries such as Tunisia, which is uh, one of the countries that provide the largest number of foreign fighters going into uh, fight with ISIS, may be the best anti ISIS policy that an outside power could adopt. Now, interestingly, there was recent work by uh, William McCants and Christopher Messerl from the Brookings Institute that focused on the origins of foreign fighters, similar to some of this, the, 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 the information that uh, Professor Jamoy was sharing with us. They also found evidence of links between unemployment and radicalization. They were writing recently uh, in Foreign Affairs and they presented a statistical analysis showing that when between 10 and 30 percent of a country's youth are unemployed, there is a strong relationship between a rise in youth unemployment and a rise in Sunni militancy. Um, they're looking at countries all over the world uh, and foreign fighter phenomena. Um, furthermore, they argue that this connection seems strongest in Francophone countries. Now this is, uh, and the authors themselves do caution that these are preliminary results fairly small data set, and it hasn't been uh, looked at by other scholars yet, so we should treat this as anecdotal evidence at best, and it has already come out, come under a fairly heavy attack, particularly this assertion that there's a link somehow with Francophone countries. Um, if you follow these sort of things, the French ambassador in the United States launched a furious Twitter tirade against uh, this article when it came out. Um, and uh, there may be some valid points. Well, I mean, they treat Belgium as a Francophone country, whereas it's actually a multilingual um, political unit. Um, and Professor Lorca was citing evidence in his talk that would suggest that unemployment uh, did not have such a strong link with the foreign fighters and phenomenon. Um, one of the things that Professor Jemai uh, noted was that. Uh, was that uh, definition of terrorism and policies towards terrorist groups are highly sensitive to the political context. Um, I always love his example of how Saddam Hussein was, was a terrorist and he was a terrorist. He was a terrorist. Nelson Mandela was a terrorist. Uh, I always look at the IRA sort of, uh, many years in, in the UK and Jerry Adams involved over time, both in uh, official and public uh, opinion, uh, is an interesting example of that as well. 
So, uh, so let's look at some of the defining features of regional Middle East politics at the moment and see if we can uh, bring that into the picture. And I point to the following factors the Syrian civil war, um, the rivalry between Saudi Arabia and Iran, and perhaps extend that and just talk about Sunni and Shia rivalries in the region, the continuing Israeli Palestinian conflict. And then the political deadlock in Iraq, which has proved unable to build an inclusive political entity to replace the regime that was removed by the U.S. invasion in 2003. That's the polite way of putting it. Um, continuing upheaval in the region following the uprisings that began in 2010, what we used to call the Arab Spring when we were young and foolish. Now, ISIS feeds off, off of all of these, and we can't look at them all, walk through some of them uh, so that we can uh, and see where they are, where they fit in. Um, Syria. The Syrian civil war is what permitted ISIS to break out of Iraq and become a global transnational organization. Uh, regional players such as Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Iraq, Iran, they all condition their response to ISIS on their policy to the broader conflict in Syria. In other words, they don't think ISIS First, they think Syrian civil war first. Their attitude to ISIS is conditioned on their answer to that. As we see, as we have seen, this makes building an anti-ISIS coalition extremely difficult. Uh, and what is clear is that as long as Syria is a role in this conflict, ISIS will have a base from which to operate. Similarly, in Iraq, until the state recaptures the lost cities such as Mosul and offers a political reconciliation that satisfies disaffected Sunnis, ISIS will have a territorial home in Iraq as well. Now looking at Syria also reminds us that ISIS is not the only group or state using terrorism in the region. Uh, Al-Qaeda has not disappeared and neither has it been defeated. Um, I refer again to the numbers that uh, Professor Jumai showed us. Um, Clint Watts of the Foreign Policy Research Institute United States reminds us that since Bin Laden has died, um, there have been a half dozen affiliates of Al Qaeda that have risen and fallen. And I think what he and other analysts are, are learning is that you have to look at local conditions rather than global trends and trying to figure out what these groups are going to be doing now and in the near future. Um, those are the determining factors in how these groups evolve and the strategies they adopt. An example. In February, many analysts noticed that al-Nusra, which is a Syrian rebel group linked to al-Qaeda, uh, was in talks with several moderate Islamic groups, and that al-Nusra's allegiance to al-Qaeda seemed to be one of the items on the negotiation table. In other words, they were willing to talk about whether or not they would remain loyal to uh, the al-Qaeda brand. And, uh, there are some indications that Al-Qaeda itself may release any groups that have pledged loyalty in that way from their loyalty pledge in order to give them the tactical flexibility they need to create alliances and uh, more positive conditions for their fight on the ground. That's probably more important in the long run uh, than a lot of the broader global trends we look at um, when it comes to what is going to happen in the months to come. All this to say is, as one of the analysts said, the, the, the situation is complex, volatile, and muddled. Which is probably a pretty good description of the Syrian civil war at this stage right now, as well. Now, as you know, um, there was intense U.S. and Russian diplomacy that led to a cessation of hostilities agreement in February. It was not called a ceasefire because it wasn't a ceasefire. At most, it was a partial ceasefire. Attacks on ISIS and other quote unquote terror groups were still allowed. If anybody needed a, an example of how terrorism or terrorist groups are defined politically, there was one right there. Um, uh, and, but most, because of this, most people expected this to be a flash in the pan, not to last very long. But contrary to those expectations, it actually led to a reduction of violence and greater access to and uh, particular food and supplies were able to get into Aleppo once again. Um, the recent news is 
not a good problem. Um, the UN Resolution 2254 that was the basis for this agreement had two goals. Start peace negotiations and reduce violence so that the humanitarian emergency could be addressed. Despite some meaning to the first goal, there had been no progress whatsoever. Was the first goal. Um, as I noted, there was some progress on the second goal, but it was always fragile and it is now a problem. Um, the UN Syria envoy Stefan de Mistura briefed the Security Council this week. He uh, said the agreement is hanging on a thread. That was him? Uh, and he called for U.S. and Russian involvement at the highest level, i.e., that means you, Putin and Obama, uh, to try and save it from complete collapse. Um, in the meantime, fighting over Lampo has increased, um, and uh, the movement of Russian artillery up to the front lines there suggests that Assad is getting ready to try and complete his conquest of that city. In the past week, approximately 200 civilians in Aleppo have died. Uh, in bombings, and a Doctors Without Borders supported hospital was one of those hit. Uh, approximately 50 people were killed there, um, including patients, and reportedly the last pediatrician working in Aleppo. And another medical facility was hit today, I just learned. Um, uh, the Assad machine says it's not us. The Russians say it's not us. Uh, but uh, it's pretty clear that um, the Assad regime is getting ready for another push into Aleppo. And lest we forget, we are talking about the largest humanitarian catastrophe in the world today. Um, the UN has registered last count almost 5 million refugees, and there are over 4 million internally displaced Syrians. And given the difficulty of collecting statistics, we have to assume that the actual numbers are higher. <coughs> Um, I'll come back to Syria when I talk a little bit about the international response, but let's move on to Iran and Saudi Arabia. This rivalry is not new, but tensions have been growing for some time. Uh, Saudi Arabia is concerned that the U.S. is finding a modus vivendi with Iran after decades of hostility. They're, they're worried they're going to have to share their U.S. ally with somebody else. Um, this is increasing their willingness to take action on their own, witness the Saudi involvement in the Yemeni civil war. This month has provided, this week practically, has provided several more examples of this increasingly sour relationship. Uh, this month, we've seen an organization of Islamic cooperation meeting in Baghdad after the Saudis engineered a final statement that was critical of Iran. A Doha meeting of major oil producers that was called uh, to discuss a Saudi proposal to freeze the oil output to try to put a floor on the price of oil refused because Iran refused to cooperate. And to be fair, uh, because Saudi Arabia refused to compromise on the proposal, at the end of it, the Russian oil minister came out and said uh, Saudi Arabia was harder to deal with than Iran. Um, and finally, talks between Saudi Arabia and Iran over the annual pilgrimage to Mecca. This is, these are talks they have every year, and the, it's always a sensitive issue for these two theocratic states. Uh, those talks collapsed too this week. So I think what we're seeing is an oil war between Saudi Arabia and Iran, as uh, Saudi Arabia tries to put a floor on the market, and Iran seeks to regain market share after being liberated from their sanctions. Um, this is not the first time they've been at loggerheads in this way. There was a similar confrontation in the, in the 80s that led to both sides losing hundreds of billions of dollars in revenue. But the regional implications for this kind of confrontation are probably more dangerous today than they were in the 80s um, because of the levels of, of uh, conflict in the, re uh, the neighboring nations. And in all of this, the Saudis have made no secret of their frustration with their American ally. Um, there's been a very chilly reception in Saudi Arabia this month. Uh, interestingly, going back to the, uh, the, the, the survey I mentioned, the Arab youth in the Gulf, by very high majorities, consider the Saudi-U.S. alliance very important for the security of the region. Um, so the official relationship may be strained, but uh, public opinion does not see the alternative to it and considers it to be a very important part of uh, uh, at least the Gulf security. Uh, 
in Iraq. In Iraq, the current government, uh, led by Prime Minister, Minister Abadi, faces a parliament that refuses to approve a cabinet designed to uh, fight uh, corruption and mismanagement and to try to move Iraq beyond sectarian politics. Uh, and start uh, make a stab at reconciliation. Um, falling oil prices are affecting this process as well. It's always harder to um, pursue politics in a time of austerity. Um, the influential Shilia Muqtad al Sadr has been leading popular protests against corruption and Vice President, President Biden flew to Baghdad this week to try and support the Prime Minister's efforts uh, because uh, the U.S. understands that without political progress in Iraq, um, military progress on the ground against uh, ISIS um, uh, will be fleet uh, and uh, not long lasting at all. Now I dwell on all this just to emphasize this point that ISIS is one part of a very large puzzle. Uh, there are no, um, I don't think there are any nations or governments in the region, or internationally, who are using their, their, uh, their attitude to ISIS to, as their primary element of decision making in what they're doing in the region. Plus, many of the regional players play both sides of the game, going back to one person's terrorist is another person's freedom fighter. Um, Saudi money from private sources supports ISIS just as it did Al Qaeda. Uh, Turkey, for the longest time, was turning a blind eye to ISIS activities on their soil uh, until very recently. Just as an example, Kuwait has at least 10 citizens or residents living in Kuwait who are on U.S. blacklist for providing uh, funding support to terrorist groups, including uh, ISIS. They are all walking free in Kuwait today. And all of these countries are supposedly allies of the United States in the fight against Daesh or ISIS. So all of them filter their attitudes towards ISIS given their larger analysis of the situation, which means that their analysis of ISIS can change and has. Um, none of these countries have to beat ISIS at the top of their to do list. Uh, now, on the international response, very quickly. Um, uh, ISIS has, is a military organization, amongst other things, the broader than that, but it has a well-organized military wing. Military means have to be a part of destabling and destroying it. Um, both U.S. and Russia have this goal, but they approach it differently. The U.S. gives priority to Iraq first, Syria second. Russia supports the Assad regime. Uh, both of us are opposed to ISIS. Um, that leads to different results, to put it um, Now, if this, if the, if the ceasefire agreement falters in Syria, and with Russian support, the Assad regime takes the level, of, this uh, will be uh, a huge battlefield development, and will be an enormous setback for the rebels, uh, including ISIS, but more so for the other rebel groups in, in Syria. So that's one thing. Um, that said, the, if you restrict your views of just how are we doing against ISIS on the military side, um, it is weaker today than it was a year ago in that region. Um, the U.S. Special Forces are in Syria. Uh, the President announced that he would be sending more. The official numbers are 50 or there, 250 more are going. Um, the Pentagon announced, made several announcements. One was that special forces had killed 40 ISIS uh, external operation leaders. What that means is people who were involved in terrorist attacks outside of the region. Could it be Brussels, Paris, Egypt, Africa? They didn't say. Um, the Pentagon estimates that ISIS has lost 500 to 800 million dollars in cash reserves due to U.S. strikes. This is the money they use to pay their fighters, including their foreign fighters. And probably most interestingly for this discussion, the flow of foreign fighters seems to have dropped precipitously. Uh, compared to a year ago today, it's down 90%. A year ago today, you had about 2,000 a month going into the region, now you have about 200. However, uh, as the head of U.S. intelligence reminded us this 
we ISIS cells are probably already in place in Europe, and specifically Italy, the UK, and Germany were mentioned. Uh, so that's the military side. Just very briefly, the the real solution will only come with our political and social and economic developments uh, in the region. Um, I already mentioned the president's trip to Iraq, which for political reconciliation there. Um, it remains to be seen if the ceasefire can be saved, but only very, very close U.S. and Russia work together to uh, give any hope of uh, pulling that one out of the fire. Um, but there is this renewed fighting. There has been no date set for new meetings in Geneva or elsewhere between the opposition and the Assad government. Um, so the chances of that happening are very slim. So I think the outlook, outlook, is, outlook is fairly grim for Syria. So that, I think, is about all I can do in the time I'm giving to me. I think the main point I want to make is that there is a context in which these organizations operate. Terrorism is not something that happens in a vacuum. And the people who commit the terrorist acts do not do so in a vacuum. That's, and, and that includes an international political context as well. But, uh, and just as uh, a political and security response in France to what's happened is not sufficient, as Professor Lorca pointed out, a military response on an international scale is not sufficient as, as well. We have to take steps that will help countries like Tunisia and others deal with the social and economic issues they face in the aftermath of what we once called the Arab Spring. Um, otherwise, we can defeat the national battle. ISIS can be wiped off the map. But those who gave birth to ISIS will wipe off the map too. And they'll just come back. So there has to be a more global, coordinated look at this. Um, otherwise, we'll be having the same conference uh, three years from now. <laughs> Thank you very much.